Hello, everyone. It's 10 o'clock, and we're going to be starting the webinar in about two minutes. Just waiting to see that people are still downloading the, the webinar client. So we'll give people about two minutes here, and then we'll start the webinar. Thanks so much for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to your questions at the end. We'll be starting in one minute here. We see uh, more people have joined us on the webinar, so thank you for that. One more minute. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, the Palomino 2015 Year Review, the State of Open Source Software. Uh, if you notice on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a place to type questions. And we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar today. So please feel free to ask anything you want. And we'll try to come around at the end if we have time to answer any of the questions that you may have. My name is Jeff Lush. I'm the founder of Palomita, and I started Palomita back in 2003, which seems like forever ago, but uh, also right around the corner. I'm Palomita's CTO, as well as I head our professional services team. And that means I, I help companies discover, manage, and remediate any of their open source issues that they may encounter, help companies with baseline reviews, M&A work, as well as rolling out the Palomita software. Today I'm going to talk about a couple subjects, but mostly what have we seen happen in the last year in the open source world, specifically how companies are using and, and, and perhaps misusing open source. Topics that we're going to address today, uh, number one is how has the software supply chain landscape changed over the last year? Uh, are organizations using more or less open source, and are they more or less aware of the open source that they're using? What are the impacts of using more open source, broader open source adoption? Some lessons learned from the vulnerabilities encountered in the open source world and the use of open source this year. And then some things that you can do to improve your processes uh, in and around open source usage that may be a good thing to do in this upcoming year if you're not doing so already. So first off, how has the software supply chain landscape changed over the last year? Let's talk about what the software supply chain is. This is everyone in the world that you get software from and you give software to. This may mean your commercial partners. This may mean your customers. This especially means the open source pipeline. So the, the open source libraries that you download, the open source source code that perhaps you're cutting and pasting into your product, uh, partners whose code and SDK that you're using, maybe outsourced development. All, all of these people, all of these companies, all these organizations are part of the software supply chain. And at each point, they are looking at your code or you are looking at their code, and you may have some questions. We'll talk a little bit about what some of those questions may be uh, in a couple slides here, but most importantly, what have we seen change? 
Uh, well, first off, in 2015, now 2016, we see some of the software languages that are being used are changing. Uh, th there's always new languages that come and go. There are some that are very trendy that look like they're going to be with us forever and then they disappear, almost to be never seen again. But others seem to have some sticking power. And three or four of the ones that we've been seeing over the last year that, that seem to really uh, be catching people's attention are the following. Uh, I would say that the winner by far has been the use of JavaScript, uh, especially with the Node framework. So JavaScript has, has really come, come in its own. Uh, traditionally, people were using JavaScript for their, their basically their web front ends, maybe to make things move or flash or change on, on your website when, you're, uh, when your customers are coming in or your users are coming into your web app. But in the last year, a new framework came out, which if you're not familiar with it already, I would recommend that you should take a look at Node. Uh, it is a, a server-side use of JavaScript, which is a, a kind of, in some ways, a little strange that, that traditionally this front-end language is now being used on the back-end. But, but some of the ideas there were, well, if we have developers writing JavaScript on the front-end, why don't we have them use JavaScript on the back-end as well? We can use all the same tools, the same libraries, the same training, the same people. And it really seemed to hit in the last year that, that doing back-end development with this framework called Node in the language JavaScript is something that we see a lot of companies do. Many of them are startups, uh, as well as many of them are, are, are trying out, uh, they're kind of a, a larger, more traditional company, trying this out with new products or small services that they may be running. This, this is an environment that still has, I would say, a ways to go in terms of maturity. Uh, the tools are still coming up to speed. The, the kind of the best practices are still coming up to speed. But I, I would not be surprised if there are developers in your organization right now either shipping or about to ship a product based on the Node framework in JavaScript. And this is something that uh, if you're if you're on the business side or the legal side, you may need to change some of your your preconceived notions about what JavaScript means and the the licensing or the vulnerability concerns that you have as it moves from the front end to the back end. So if I was going to leave you with one thing in terms of new languages, it would be JavaScript and Node, something to definitely pay attention to. Um, others that we see to, to a certain extent that, that, that are, are simmering out there, uh, there's a language called Go. There's one called Clojure that, that we see from time to time. Uh, these are These are Smaller use languages, they, they have a lot of publicity. They have a lot of, uh, let's say, local proponents. We, we don't see them uh, in very large numbers in, in people who are doing open source development compared to all the other languages in the world. But they, they do have their vocal proponents. And we are seeing them in, in customer code and, and other review work. So again, things to be aware of. Uh, Go and Clojure that they exist. They're kind of, you know, they're, they're traditional languages, but at the same time, uh, you may not be familiar with them or the ecosystem or the kind of the best practices. And uh, you may want to ask your developers if, if you haven't heard these these languages before. Are we using them? How are we using them? They very often are mixed in with more of the traditional languages. Um, so it's a good question to ask. Uh, the, the, the other new language that we see out there is kind of a, a cousin to an old language, which is um, Swift. And if you're doing any mobile development on iOS, so for iPhone or, or uh, iPad, your developers almost certainly these days are using Swift for new work. Uh, very similar in some ways to the old ecosystem around the Objective-C. So it's not a, not a surprise to see it here. And well, it's what we'd call the new normal for iOS development. Um, in some ways, uh, kind of just taking the mantle from Objective-C, very similar people, companies, and, and, and frameworks at play there. So that said, the traditional languages and frameworks still dominate. You know, we, we've talked now about JavaScript and Node and Go and Clojure. Those languages, as, as, as interesting and important as they are, uh, are, are a small fraction of the code that's being written right now. Uh, if you look at what, what are most developers, most software products, you know, in the enterprise space and the non-enterprise space are going to be 
the traditional languages, Java, C Sharp, .NET, C, C++. Those really dominate the discussions, really dominate the lines of code or, or packages shipped and used. Uh, these may trend a little bit, I'll say in the Java, Java world, but traditionally this was an enterprise server-side language. But now with the, the, the real explosion of Android, especially Android Mobile, uh, we are seeing Java being used as an operating system language. We're seeing it used as a, as a end user application language, especially on, on the Android side. So kind of changing, changing some of the, the again, the legal and, and vulnerability best practices as, as Java moves from, say, something purely in the back of the house as, say, an enterprise language or a server language to now something that's being um, distributed on, on millions of devices. And that's some slight changes. And, and again, if you're in the legal world, you may want to update your feelings about what does Java mean and what are the, what are the approved licenses or, or best practices around the use of Java. Uh, similar, similar world for C Sharp. Uh, traditionally, it has been a server-side back-end uh, product as well as the desktop. So traditional desktop applications in the Windows world are these days very likely being written in C Sharp. In some ways, no changes there. Uh, Back-end best practices remain there. The front-end uh, application best practices remain there. But the, the, the explosion of languages, of the libraries available for C-sharp has really been uh, telling in the last year. A lot of the libraries that were traditionally available, say, for other languages, have been ported to C-sharp or have had the moral equivalents written. And we're seeing a very rich ecosystem in the, the .NET world around open source libraries, especially with their availability. And that brings us to our, our last traditional language, C and C++. This is, this, these are the languages of Linux. These are the languages of embedded or networking companies. So if you see a device that has a Ethernet port on the back, or if it has a, a Wi-Fi chip inside of it, almost certainly this is being powered at its heart by C and C++. We see this a lot in healthcare, in a traditional healthcare environment. We see this in anything, anything with a networking stack inside of it. You're, you're going to have at your heart C and C++, and almost certainly you're going to have uh, Linux and GPL licensing concerns at the heart of these devices. So what's changed in how we use these languages? So there's been some changes in the languages that you could use. There's also been a big change, especially in the last year, about how we pull in code written in these languages. So one of the big changes has been really the, the, the increase in usage of what's called repository management systems. And what these are, are you may have heard terms such as Maven, NuGet, Node Package Manager, things like that in the past. And what these are are things used by the developers to manage their use of third-party software. So a developer may sit down and write in a configuration file a list of all the libraries that they need. So instead of physically downloading the libraries and putting them into source code management, which is the traditional way of including open source, the traditional way of including third-party software, instead what they do is they install a repository management system and they, they write configuration files for the management system and say, please go download this library, or please go download a library with this version or any greater version than this. And what this allows is maybe a little more convenient management of products and their dependencies. If, if something gets updated out there in the wild, you can set your system to update your, your, your code base as well automatically. Uh, you can also make it very easy to say, I want to use this particular component and let the repository management system uh, handle all of the dependency management. So there may be dozens, if not hundreds, of other libraries that your choice requires. And so you, you, you basically outsource the heavy lifting to the repository management system. This has some pluses and minus, minuses. I would say one of the big pluses is it's convenient. It makes it really easy to use open source. It makes it very easy for your developers to say, I'm going to use this and keep that, keep that item uh, kind of updated in your system. I would say the big downside is it's kind of a surprise sometimes what libraries you're using, what components you're using. 
Uh, if you say, I want to use this particular database or I want to use this particular crypto library, it automatically will download dependencies that you were not aware of or you did not look at or vet or agree to use except through the use of the, the, the parent component. And this is really causing uh, kind of some lack of visibility into what people are using. And sometimes a, a disconnect between what people think they're using and what they actually are using. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides here. But if, I, if you're going to take away one big thing um, about kind of a big change in development is the use of, of these repository management systems. So I have a small table here about some of the, the more common languages and platforms. And if you're not familiar with these repository managers, I, I'd recommend that you go talk to your developers a little bit about are we using these things? How are we using them? How are we managing the components that are coming in? Are we, are we doing periodic reviews, et cetera? So Java, for example, is, is the, traditional, the traditional one that we talk about here. And it's, there's a repository manager. They're called Maven, which is where you would get all your compiled Java jars. In the csharp.net world, there's an equivalent called Nougat, which will download, say, your DLLs and other, other libraries, binary libraries like that. JavaScript with Node has the Node Package Manager that really, in some ways, came from nowhere and is now seen all over the place. Uh, and especially in Node, you will see typically hundreds of third-party dependencies being brought in, just to the nature of JavaScript having smaller libraries, smaller components, more, more the, 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 the Swiss Army knife approach of pulling in small pieces and, and wiring them together. And others that round out here, Ruby Gems, Cocoa Pods, if you're doing iPhone development. And then uh, the, the RPMs and DEBs that are being managed if you're using, building a Linux operating system or you're putting uh, modifications or additions on top of Linux. So these are, these are um, uh, kind of the main ones that you'll see out there are dozens more. Uh, and I may have, may have left out your favorite one here, but these are the ones that traditionally you would see if you were a, a larger organization. These are the ones that would be bubbling up uh, across your engineer's desk. Very often, the, the legal team and the management teams may not be familiar that this change in development practices has happened over the last uh, handful of years here. And it's, I think, one of the biggest disconnects between what people think they're using and what they, what they really are using. And so uh, my biggest takeaway is getting getting control of your use of third-party items brought in by repository managers is one of the best things you can do in terms of uh, keeping track of what you're actually using. So how else, what else has changed in, in the last year? Um, you know, back in, back in 2014, 2015, Heartbleed made a very big splash. Uh, we, we, we saw a flurry of activity back in 2014 when the Heartbleed vulnerability was first discovered, and there was this first wave of, of addressing this in the in the public world. Uh, front page news everywhere, TV news even. You know, how often do we hear TV news talking about uh, software vulnerabilities or open source software vulnerabilities? But Heartbleed was one of those. Well, what we've seen in basically the last say it was called year year and a half is there's going to be a long of up, upgrade, upgrades and unexpected late disclosures. To this day, we still are finding unpatched uh, products still running OpenSSL with the Heartbleed vulnerability in it. This is now a year and a half later. It was, it was found in, uh, I think, April of 2014 or March of 2014. You would have expected after that big push to get everything upgraded, we, we would have, everybody would have found all these. And I would say that the vast majority of items are still unpatched. Un, uncontrolled use of, of the Heartbleed vulnerability because it's sitting out there. And I think we can generalize from this that, that there's going to be, uh, with every vulnerability found, there's going to be the, the, the correct patching in that first month or two, but then a long tail of kind of almost zombie systems or stale systems that are out there that will not, will not have these things addressed and found until there's either some sort of software audit or uh, a problem with them. Basically, you know, vulnerability being uh, used. And late disclosures is what we mean when you get a, a note about an upgrade and then buried down in the uh, release notes is saying, you know, we upgraded our OpenSSL to uh, CVE XYZ. Uh, we see these things happening uh, you know, a year or so later. Um, 
very often due to uh, kind of a software audit or a, some sort of um, usage of the vulnerability to get in. Um, because of this, because of this long tail, we're seeing more organizations requiring what we call real disclosures from partners. If you're doing something that's non-trivial and your disclosure list is a handful of items, it's a pretty good sign that it's not a real disclosure. Uh, we expect hundreds of items in a disclosure list. And if you're only seeing single items, um, maybe a couple dozen, and it's it's something real. You know, you're paying serious money for either the product or you're paying serious money for the, the relationship, or the product has uh, you know a, a, a manual that's hundreds of pages long. Our, our expectation is you're, you're going to have, have hundreds of open source libraries there, hundreds of open source components. And so some of the more uh, larger organizations or folks who have been burned in the past or have done their own uh, light reviews are now pushing back on their partners saying, that's great that you give us this little list, but we just did a quick sniff test and we found OpenSSL, we found Zlib, we found uh, Tomcat, all the things that are not on your disclosure list. And the fact that these were not disclosed tells us that you're not disclosing the smaller parts as well. So uh, expect that if you're, if you're playing with somebody in the, you know, the, the top 50 or top 100 software companies in the world, that that, that request is likely going to come uh, when you deliver new software, especially if there's a partnership or some sort of reselling and engagement. Uh, Linux-based devices are definitely paying more attention to the deep Linux issues, both on the, the licensing side and the vulnerability side. Uh, there's been some, some um, kind of famous lawsuits in, uh, in the last year that have really pointed people down to the lowest levels of their, their use of Linux and the use of the Linux stack. And if you basically are selling something that has, a, my, my simple test is if it has an Ethernet port on the back or a Wi-Fi chip, pretty good sign that you are shipping Linux. And we can spend days talking about Linux compliance and, and the right thing to do and how to do it. But uh, I, I still see the, the vast majority of companies who are not ship, who are shipping Linux-based devices from, you know, from the Internet of Things up to airplanes still have a very long way to go. Uh, in terms of getting, you know, staying, getting in the compliance and, and paying attention to all the, the licensing and vulnerability issues there. Uh, it, it did change in 2015. I'll talk about that in a little bit here. Uh, we, we've seen kind of the, the push for, for deeper analysis in the Linux world, but it's still, there's still a long way to go. Um, Non-phone use of Android. So basically people building devices with Android as the operating system. So instead of using Linux, you know, traditionally Linux instead of traditionally using a traditional, say, real-time operating system or uh, embedded operating system, you're starting to move to Android uh, for all the for all the standard reasons. There, there are, you know, lots of features, big community, uh, maybe some good licensing, uh, to, or at least the top end of things there, um, and they're becoming more popular. It's one of those things where we see if people are making a decision right now. Android is now in the top list of are we going to be using Linux, Windows, or now Android? Uh, so that is a, that's a big change, and it's a good, another good question to be asking your teams. If you are shipping a device, again, anything that's you know, wrapped in plastic or a bare board, what's powering it? What is our operating system? And how are we, you know, how are we staying compliant? What questions have we been asking? Are we actually doing our disclosure lists, et cetera? Um, we, are, we have seen an uptick in people starting to do deeper dives in the open source co components, so doing scans and other deep analysis before they use the open source library. And th this, is, this is especially in cases where people are saying, we're moving from a proprietary framework to an open source framework, or we decided not to write this core piece because we feel that the open source world is, is in some ways doing it better than we would. But we also need to make sure that we're not uh, kind of taking in things that we can't support or as licensing that we, we, we can't respect for whatever reason, or, or is it just not paying attention to security or export control issues in the way that you would. So starting to see some of the larger companies uh, add this as part of their, their component ingestion framework, saying, okay, either all or ones that have hit a certain kind of a importance to the business need to get either a light scan or a deep scan. 
And then that helps them integrate themselves into the ecosystem a little more. They find problems, they can push those back upstream as opposed to going at the, going at their, their own. And that's another change we've seen in the, the kind of the use of open source is uh, companies that previously perhaps would have kept um, licensing problems internal because they were either fixing them themselves or deciding not to use those those libraries, those open source libraries, are now working more closely with the the uh, open source person or the open source team there to say, you know, we don't like what you're doing here with this disclosure. We don't like what you're doing with this use of, um, you know, snippets that say stolen from X, Y, Z. You know, we can't ship any code that says that. You shouldn't be shipping code that says that. How can we get that fixed so we can use your component? And that's been an, a very nice change, I think, in how legal and engineering works with the open source world, becoming a little more, whether it's public or just uh, reaching out you know, using private channels to get things cleaned up and to the level that they would they would ship internally. And then uh, another word that that you that you may have heard some buzz around, but may may not you know really understand what's going on there is containers. Uh, we are seeing containers starting to be used all over the place and now starting to be shipped to customers or it being the kind of the, the expected way that your product may be delivered or used by customers. And containers are, you know, I would say, the, the, short, the short story there. I won't quite do it justice here, but the idea of a container is much like when we moved from having real physical hardware to virtual machines, uh, and that reduced kind of the, the weight of, of you know, what it took to spin up a product as well instead of spinning up a huge piece of hardware now I can spin create and destroy a virtual machine at will containers you can almost think of as lighter weight virtual machines it's not quite doing it justice but uh, it's a, maybe a good way to think about it and containers have all the all the concerns that we traditionally have around use of open source are we respecting the licensing are we complying with the licensing are, are we basically using black boxes that we don't know what's going on there and inside of it there's 300 open source libraries and commercial libraries being used. So a good question to start talking to your dev teams and legal teams about is your use of containers. How are they being shipped? How are they being managed? Uh, are you downloading random containers from the internet? You know, that's a very common way to get a, get a first system up and running. Uh, what is, what's your policy around these things? And, and how, are, are, have you expanded your open source policy to include containers? And, and I, I, I'm starting to see some movement on that there, but these things always lag behind. So as, as you're looking at your docs and your policies for the year, um, containers and repository managers are, are two things that I would highly recommend. Uh, you sitting down and thinking about how does this affect your open source usage policies? How does it affect your open source training? And, and What's, what are your policies? What are your policies around containers and tracking containers, et cetera? So this brings us to kind of our classic question that we, we try to talk about and address every year is, you know, are organizations more or less aware of the open source that they're using? And, and I always find that this is sometimes the most surprising element of this presentation every year is just how much more open source is being used. And last year surprised even me. In 2015, we saw an almost doubling of known open source components in use uh, by the people we work with. And what does that mean? Well, it means back in 2014, when we do our census, we saw about 250 open source components in the, the average or the typical uh, review. Well, in 2015, the average or typical review was showing over 450 components. This is an almost doubling. You can see it here from the graph. Where, where basically from 2011 to 12, 13, 14, 15, we see a, kind of a, the drumbeat of more and more usage, more and more usage, more and more usage, and then kind of an uptick in the graph here. And I'll talk a little bit about, about some of the trends that I think are, are causing this uptick. But the, 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 I think the important takeaway from, from this graph and this information here is this is the average application that we're looking at here, 450 items. Even last year, if you're looking 250 items. These, these are what you should be expecting as the baseline for either your products or the products that you're using. So if you don't get a disclosure list from your partner that's 200 or 300 or 400 items, you should, you should be pretty sure that you're not getting the whole story. 
if uh, if you are um, if you're building your own product, you should expect that your number is going to get even higher. These numbers in some ways always lag. These, these numbers show what people are about to release, not always what they're building right now. So I expect these numbers to you know increase, probably even, maybe even similar numbers uh, this year. The the other big takeaway from this is the percentage disclosed. That's the second column in this graph here, the orange line at the bottom. It's been my experience that companies are horrible at being able to tell people what they're using. That there's a lot of feeling that, every, that we're tracking this, we know what's going on. Uh, oh yeah, of course we can tell our, 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 our users what, what the list is. But when the rubber hits the road and you say, produce a disclosure list, produce a list of known open source, it's double digits at that. And last year, what's amazing to me, is the average project could only disclose eight items. And when you ask them, what are you using, they'll say something like, oh, we're using MySQL, we're using Linux, we're using Node, we're using Tomcat. Very large infrastructure pieces, typically handled by the IT teams instead of the developers. And that that is always surprising to me, but then after doing this now for 11 years, it's not surprising. So your expectation is you're going to hear 20 items, 30 items on a bill of materials. What you should really read that as, as is add a zero to the end. You, you, you should be expecting 200, 400 items. And the disclosure rate we saw last year went down to 2%, which is, which is very small. I mean, that's almost like not having a disclosure list. And frankly, the average company has a, a, a zero length disclosure list. So the average disclosure is zero items. The fact that a few companies are able to disclose anything at all brings this off to of zero percent. And this is this is every company that I've ever gone to. This is the expectation: is very low list, or if there is a list of items, it was made that day. And maybe somebody went to the system and, and did a quick visual inspection or a grep, and they pulled together a list. But that was the first time anybody's ever looked at it. It's full of libraries and licenses that either are not shipped or have licenses that you would never want to disclose outside of your organization because you're not in compliance, or have known vulnerabilities that were fixed two years ago. So if you do get a disclosure list, it's also very common that it is it has not been vetted, it has not been reviewed. There's some tests that you can do, looking for certain components or versions of components or licenses that, that will tell you that um, kind of a auto-generated list has not been reviewed by business, legal, and engineering. So what changed? And this this is this is always interesting to watch year after year. Is is how does our you know our, our in some ways our, our industry remains the same, but there are some things that change. And and what changed in the last year that really made that 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 graph change? Well, there really breaks down to two things. There there was re, more real open source usage. That's un, undeniable. That the, the more companies who traditionally not used open source opened up the door last year. There was also more analysis. And so it's a little bit of these things have always been there, but now people are becoming aware of them. And, and what I saw last year was a combination of, of both of these. So in terms of the, the, the more open source usage, executives, businesses, whoever you want to say is the gatekeeper there, has loosened restrictions on using open source. You know, we've seen even Microsoft out there saying, we are shipping open source, we're using open source, et cetera, et cetera. More companies have, have been shouting from the rooftops that they are all about open source and, and use us and we'll use your open source, you use our code, et cetera, et cetera. Please just open up the floodgates. We want we want to build a product that is you know the the, the best of the open source world. So the, the the floodgates have been open there in terms of using it. We see larger, more complex systems in use as well. So more and more embedded devices more and more things like containers and virtual machines that are being produced and then shipped as the final product. Uh, and these, these complex systems have things like entire operating systems. They have uh, things that are being managed by these repository managers or other coordination systems that people say, build me, build me a whole device that has this operating system, this database, this security system in it, this, 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 and this. Next thing you know, you, you, you are your own operating system vendor uh, when you're building these containers or these, these virtual machines or these physical devices. Um, there's use of many, many small packages. And, and what we see here is things like the jQuery ecosystem, the Node ecosystem, 
really trends to smaller pieces that then get reused. So maybe in the Java world or the C, C++ world, you might have a library like Boost that, that is tens of millions of lines large and does everything, but it's a single line item. As opposed to maybe in the Node world, you might have 300 or 400 or 1,000 libraries that do all the little things that that one C++ library does, but it's smaller little pieces, more surgical. Use this little piece, use that little piece. And in the grand scheme of things, you might not be using any more code. There might not, might not be more lines of code in the node versus boost example, but you're going to be dividing those modules at a much uh, more granular level. Uh, and that can be, that can sometimes cause some management concern, legal concern, because you, you, instead of seeing one item, you see 300 items. That, that does cause some management paralysis and, and security paralysis and legal paralysis. And the package managers we've talked about before has greatly increased the open source counts where it all it takes is a developer to say, I want this, 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 and this, and you pull in a, a, a graph of dependencies, a dependency tree that pulls in a dependency tree and so on and so on. It's become very easy to add a zero to the number of components that you're using. There's also been a requirement of more analysis. Uh, the level of expected analysis has increased. So much like I showed, showed before with the, the you tell me 10, I expect 100 story, more and more companies have, have, have seen this, either been burned by bad disclosures or they've done their own sniff tests at ingestion or their customers have come to them saying, you know, I got this note about Heartbleed update but I never saw that you were using OpenSSL in your disclosed list of open source packages. There's a disconnect there. If you're, if you're patching open source vulnerabilities, but you're not disclosing your use of open source, it's going to make me call into question the whole disclosure list. And, and, and post Heartbleed, we've seen that a lot. Um, that's been one of the, the easy tests for people to say, am I getting a, a good open source disclosure list? Is Did they patch OpenSSL, but they never told me that they're actually using OpenSSL? What else aren't they telling me? The, the deeper analysis of Linux and the subsystems in use is definitely being seen. So for many years, people would just say, oh, we're using Linux, too complicated. Don't, I, I don't want to spend the mind, money or the time to go deep into that. Let's call it a single line item or not even disclose it at all. And well, you know, with, with, with some of the pressure, I think, uh, being pushed by the Linux community, you know, the, the folks that are out there saying, you know, if you're using our stuff, you better be complying with the licenses. Uh, it's starting, I think it's starting to sink in into the industry that, that Linux is not just a black box, it's not just capital F free. There are definitely obligations that need to be followed there. As well as companies when they see that they're getting things like physical devices, routers, uh, uh, containers that clearly have you know, lots of Linux based items inside of it, that, that they, there's a real need for a disclosure list there. Um, even if you're, all you're caring about is say vulnerabilities, you need to, need to know what's going on there. Um, so the legal teams have definitely increased their ability to handle larger component lists. I think this comes with tooling. I think it comes with experience. I think this comes with some uh, maybe some good court cases that have kind of brought things to the forefront, and there's been some really good discussion on the legal lists and, and even in the popular press. So uh, I, I can't tell you, you know, years ago when I started helping companies, I gave them a list of 30 libraries that would be an amazing list. They would, they, would, they would go away sometimes for weeks on this list of 30 to figure out what's going on. Um, we've, we've delivered a list of thousands of components in the last year, and I've been able to see the legal teams, at least certain organizations, to say, got it. We know what to do with this. We have the tooling. We have the people. We have the training. We have the experience to handle this. There's still going to be some edge cases. There's still going to be some things where they say, oh, we, you know, this is just too weird. Uh, to handle this license or that license, but we've seen people being able to add a zero to their ability to handle these things. I would still say there is perhaps a natural uh, number that people are able to handle right now, which is maybe about 300 to 500 components. That seems to be kind of the, 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 the number that, if, that if it, that's given to a legal and business and engineering team. That's, that's a big chunk for them to, to process and understand how they're using these things and are they shipped or are they not shipped. Um, I see the true numbers going up higher than that. If you're shipping a router right now, you have by thousands of libraries 
but companies are kind of handling them in three three to five hundred chunks. I think I think the legal teams are definitely going to be able to increase their ability as, as time goes on, but it's still something to be aware of. There is a natural what's called high water mark that is the ability, ability of these teams to deal with, and we sometimes have to uh, fight our battles carefully. What are the most serious issues here, or the traditional most serious issues? What are things that we should use as bellwether components or licenses or events to then uh, expand our knowledge from you know, this particular type of cut and paste? Is this a big deal? And if it is, we're going to be worried about other things. You know, how, what's our use of Stack Overflow? Are we worried about licensing there? What's our, what about our use of unlicensed components? Or how do we handle commercial code with Heartbleed problems? Those are the things that I see companies are spending a lot of time to figure out and then expand them. And then, and then the lastly in here is, is the technical due diligence process, especially on M&A, has, has allowed more review. The budgets have increased, the time has increased to a certain extent, because they know that this is their chance to get things right, uh, basically clean, clean the bill of materials up. And it also really allows them to get some good, good vision into what's actually going on in this company. Uh, these deep dives expose the, the languages that are in use, the, the, the component frameworks that are in use, the databases that are in use, the commercial relationships are in use. This is very eye-opening for, for people. and It's a good tool to get deep there. So what are some of the impacts on the, on the, the, the broader open source adoption? What, what's, 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 what are we seeing companies, and I don't want to use the word struggle with, but starting to put together um, a bigger team, a bigger budget, a bigger uh, set of best practices? Well, you know, obviously, if, if I suddenly have to deal with 500 items or 1,000 items in a typical product, um, there's more obligations to be followed. The legal teams are, are being kind of leaned on more to give advice and give, give you know, are we able to ship this or not? Uh, and I would say that the, the obligations around the notice requirement. You know, some people may call it the attribution requirement, the notice requirement, the basically a list of copyrights and other things that may be um, required in, say, your documentation or your about boxes or preserved in your headers. We are starting to see more pressure from, say, public company boards to say, we need to make sure that we're doing all the right things. We can't cut corners on this. Uh, we, we see pressure from the, the open source community saying, you know, give, you got to give us credit. Um, and so the, 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 the change I see is more, more credit, you know, more credits are being paid attention to. But that also still requires a lot of effort to collect those credits, uh, correct those notices, make sure they're showing up in the right places, uh, up, keep them fresh. It's one thing to do it once, but to keep it to keep it fresh. And I, I still think there's, the industry has a long way to go before we're anywhere near uh, any even okay compliance with the notices requirements. Uh, but I've, I've seen the change in the legal teams and the engineering teams in the last year, particularly. The people are starting to say, our, our customers are asking for this. We need to produce these things. We need to start putting this in place. Uh, the security updates, obviously, is a, is, is a big deal. Heartbleed opened up the floodgates of uh, pu you know, loud public disclosures of, of widespread vulnerabilities. And... Um, that list, I think, is just, the, the vulnerabilities have already always been there. They perhaps have always been uh, being exploited, but now there's more pipelines about this information and, and where it may be. And, 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 and just, I think, it, you know, you know, hear about a certain company having a billion devices out there. That's a, that's a big target. So what's, what what open source component is out there running on a billion devices or half a billion devices? Uh, and when we're talking about 500 items, a thousand items per product and you have multiple products on the same device, a lot to watch. We talked about the companies expecting disclosures, expecting the security updates. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, you know what, I have a physical device, and I read about this, uh, maybe it's an operating system vulnerability, Android vulnerability, or Heartbleed vulnerability, or OpenSSL vulnerability. I'm going to get my update. Well, it seems that I'm on, a, I'm on an end of life branch. Well, that's causing some heat and light and noise for certain organizations that are out there because the older trees maybe not being patched the way the newer trees are, but the people still have those devices. They still have those applications. They haven't, they haven't been end of life to the customers. Perhaps they have toward the original manufacturer. 
and that's something where I'm seeing cause a little bit of uh, kind of unhappiness in the user community, um, where public open source vulnerabilities are being disclosed and talked about, known in certain areas but not being patched. Um, as, as open source selection becomes a more widespread job duty, you know, instead of it used to be more of the architect would pick it, now it's pretty much every developer has the ability to make a change in these repository managers and download it. Um, we're seeing more increased training required. And um, uh, in terms of what type of training is required, my opinion is you can't train this more uh, enough. Uh, it should be part of your onboarding and much, much like your ethics and other types of training that you do yearly, my opinion, you should be training about open source and license issues, copyright issues, vulnerability issues with your entire team every year. Enough changes every year that you should do it. And also, I, I find that uh, onboarding process is often very confusing to people. It's often uh, you know, trying to get their job done while they're clicking through all these things. If you go take your, your the middle of your team out for pizza or food or whatever fast food you want to do, and ask them some pointed questions about the GPL, or ask them some pointed questions about um, vulnerabilities. You're probably not going to like what you hear. I hear a lot of folklore. I hear a lot of misinformation. I hear just a lot of lack of information. And these are the people who are making the vast majority of your component selections, or, or the people who are being asked, are you know, are we okay? And I, I still see, even in 2016. A, a real severe lack of open source training and open source license knowledge in the line level developer, and, and I think that's that's a, a failure in our industry that we need to we need to fix. And we also see that the legal cases are targeting the lower level components. We, we we've seen some cases now in the last couple of years about people looking at eight lines of code, ten lines of code, and and that that really means that your microscope may need to come out more. Uh, and, and, and as you saw those previous numbers, the bellwether for me is if people aren't disclosing large components. They're not disclosing their entire um, application server or their entire database. Um, I really can't expect them to be knowing what's going on in a cut and paste here or a file based you know, file by file uh, usage elsewhere in their system. So uh, I, I think for you know as these cases increase and potentially increase. It's a sign to us that we need to, you know, pay attention at the high level as well as the low level, especially if you're in certain industries or using certain technologies. So, uh, what are the, some of the lessons we learned from this year's open source vulnerabilities? You know, first thing I like to say is, um, I don't think open source has a worse vulnerability problem than closed source. You know, I think there's many people who say that open source actually has a, a better track record around vulnerability detection patching, fixing. So I, I don't want to leave anyone with any sort of misunderstanding that uh, open source is, has vulnerables, is, vulnerabilities is bad, etc. I, I think some of the best you know, work is actually going on in the open source world. But what we're seeing is there are these long tails. There's just so much usage out there that we can't expect that um, just because a vulnerability was announced that it's going to be fixed. And I like using Heartbleed, the OpenSSL component, as a great um, example here because everybody's using it. You, you probably have 25, maybe more copies of OpenSSL on the devices that you carry around with you every day. Each managed by a different team, each delivered to you by a different development development company, and and some organizations are better than others in terms of discovering it and tracking it. So we still find, as I said before, the versions of OpenSSL that are vulnerable to Heartbleed now over a year after the defect was first announced. So April 2014 is when people first announced it. I'm sure if I checked with my audit team today and said how many copies of the Heartbleed vulnerability did you detect, maybe one or two that were found in currently shipping products. I, I think this is a big deal. I think this is a, I look at this and this is one of the first things that I'll talk about when I do a report out with a company to say, you're still shipping Heartbleed. You're still, you know, whether or not whether or not this is going to be a way that people are going to hack you or not hack you, you know, your customer is going to look and say, how how can you not have patched this? How can you not have upgraded this? How did you not know this was here after a year and a half? So my advice always is, you know, make this a non-issue. Do what you got to do: upgrade, patch, address it, get ahead of it, just so that you're not paying, playing catch up with it. Um, 
you know, where are we finding it? You know, first off, this unexamined code bases all types. The average developer development organization has not been looking for it the, after that week. You know, they they didn't if they, if they didn't do it the week or two after Harpleet was discovered. We're just not seeing a lot of uh, mindful looking for these things. Um, we see it embedded in commercial libraries and open source binaries all the time. So things that were compiled a year ago, things that were compiled two, three years ago, almost think of them as being pickled. They're, they're put there, they're working, they're working happily, uh, but uh, people don't know they're there. They're tracking commercial library foo or commercial library bar, and there was no open source disclosure about the use of OpenSSL there. And then we can come in and we, we find it buried deep inside that binary. Um, that then the organizations now have to figure out how do we how do we patch how do we patch this? Can we go upstream and get a new version? Because our commercial license will allow for that, and so on and so on. Uh, if, if you haven't put that together already, you should figure out how do you, how how do you work with your commercial vendors to ask them about potential vulnerabilities, to ask them about getting upgrades based on that. So embedded in larger open source based components as well. You, know, you bring in something that's got five million lines of code. It's an open source library. Um, you might not know that OpenSSL is in there. It, it's still the case that the average component, whether it's commercial or open source, is not doing good disclosures. You don't know that the envelope issues are there. And then the, the, the new one that was really interesting to me in this last year is about what I call stale containers or stale virtual machines. Again, another type of pickling where people say, we built an application for internal use, or this is how we deliver it to our customers is this virtual machine. And that virtual machine sits there happily running for years. Um, and maybe maybe the, the Linux operating system there hasn't been patched anymore. You know, they haven't been paying for the upgrades, or they haven't physically been running the upgrades. Or um, the, maybe the operating system's been happily upgrading, but the, the use of openness is on the product the installed base problem has not been upgraded. And this has been something that's come across my desk in the last year that is um, very interesting to me, because it shows that companies are starting to do a census of their virtual machines, are starting to do a census of all the, 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 the business you know, apps that they, they, they depend on, and what, what are they running on? Real hardware, container, out there in the cloud, et cetera. And, and you know, just because something was shipped and, and the, the team maybe has moved on to something else, what, what are we doing? What are, what's our next steps in terms of keeping upgraded, in terms of uh, uh, patching things like OpenSSL and others? And then the last thing just about this is, is Harpleet was a great example of putting visibility on something that was not very top of mind for many people. This was a low-level component. It you know, does a great job of doing what it does, but it's something that would never rise above the, you know, into the headline of features of your product. It was, you know, so, right, we need, we need uh, crypto. It's Let's pull in a crypto library. Um, that's not, not something that people were, were, were featuring. Now, as we look at people now doing larger works based on things like uh, maybe it's software-defined networking. Maybe it's things like uh, uh, operating systems. Maybe it's things like um, you know, pulling in all these NuGet packages, Maven packages, where we start to say, well, what are we depending on? What are our big pieces? What, 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 is, what is providing our crypto? What is providing our our um, networking stack? What is our operating system? And people are starting to ask those questions. You know, just because there's been no vulnerability uh, reported for a certain library, in my opinion, that's almost worse. It means nobody's looking for vulnerabilities there. You know, if you look at anybody's product, you're going to find a, a potential vulnerability. And the, the components that have no vulnerabilities probably a sign that nobody cares, nobody's looking for them. Maybe, in fact, some of the worst issues for you. So we're getting toward the top of the hour here, and I do want to allow some time for questions. Um, so let me just do this one last page here, and then we'll get to the questions. So you can't boil the ocean. And, and so one of the things I've seen people be very successful over the last year is when they're looking at their, their libraries, they're saying, we have 500 items, we have 1,000 items, we have 2,000 items. Where do we start? You know, my opinion is you always want to have a full accounting if you can but people can't get there right away. They can't boil the ocean. So in, where, do we, where do we often recommend people start? Well, there's a, there's a list of six items here that I, I think are great places to start. You should finish with them. You should also you know, figure out if there's things that are important to your, your organization or your, your particular domain. But if you look and you say, let's go ask pointed questions to our development team. 
what are we using to provide cryptography? And are we using multiple libraries? Are commercial products doing crypto inside of them? What are they using? Um, it's top of mind. This is Harpley. This is all the other OpenSSL issues that come out every couple of weeks. Not because there's anything particularly wrong with OpenSSL, it's just that people are looking. People are looking deeper. So where is your use of crypto? What is your use of compression components like Zlib? Uh, what is your use of multimedia? Things like FFmpeg and others. Um, your application platform. So what does your whole platform run on? Is it Tomcat? Is it a certain version of PHP? Is it a certain version of Node? These often, um, again, are going to be looked at with a very close microscope and often are going to have a, a, a vulnerability detected that require you to upgrade your entire stack. And um, these are often very easy to find out from the outside. Sometimes the, 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 the networking tools will sometimes even tell you, oh, I have this version of Tomcat, I have this version of HTTP daemon, I have this version of et cetera. So again, try to, try to reduce your public um, visibility of these things to, to using stale components. And the last two databases, great bellwether question to ask your team. I always like saying, what are you using for open source? Oh, we're not using open source. Oh, what's your database? Oh, we're using MySQL. Big disconnect we've just found right there in terms of the team's understanding of what open source is and what they're using. And then operating systems. I think you can't, you can't spend enough time uh, just thinking of your best practices, thinking of how you're going to be, end up doing compliance here around Linux and others as well. So in terms of... Um, Organization, let me just get here to the questions. I think we have about five minutes here. And let me, let me go through here. Okay. Let me, there was a question about repository management features in Palomita, the product itself. So I'll just you know, very quickly say, um, let's, let's talk offline of that. We do have repository management features in the product, and uh, we can definitely, if you're a Palomita customer already, we can talk about those things offline. Okay. Next question we have here is a question about zero-day vulnerabilities. So how to find and address zero-day vulnerabilities. And, and this, is, this is something I think is, is, is coordination of many tools, coordination of many best practices and many people. Um, I would say you, you um, in terms of zero-day vulnerabilities, I think there's a really good chance that if you're using, if you're doing the type of analysis we discussed today, you may be somebody who's going to find a new potential vulnerability, um, what I call the envelope issue. You're using a open source library that maybe is not in the top 100 of what people are always talking about but buried inside of it is maybe a particular version of a, a, a crypto component or a compression component or whatnot that, that does have a known vulnerability. Those vulnerabilities may be causing a vulnerability in that library that you're using. And that's what for, our, for the people I've worked with who have been doing the kind of analysis for zero days and you know, what, what can we do to get ahead of the, the reporting of the, the, the big pieces? You have to look for things like that, saying, I know that um, old crypto, old compression, often is targeted as a way of getting into these components. Can I can I find that maybe this thing, which is not hasn't been reported as having a vulnerability, may in fact have a vulnerability? Okay. Uh, next question is: Can we can we send a slide set of the slides? Yes, as always, we'll we'll be sending out a copy of these slides to all the participants as well as, I believe, posting on our, our page here as well. So that, that's bringing us here to the top of the hour. Um, I really thank everybody for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments and you'd like to follow up with us afterward, um, please send us information. You can reach me personally at jeff at palomita.com. I always love to hear feedback about these presentations. Love to hear what you guys are looking for. Uh, we often do in-depth. Uh, private webinars or private sessions for folks, so please please reach out and let me know if you'd like to uh, uh, see any new topics in the future or go deeper on a particular topic. As well as if you're not following us on Twitter, please do. We're at Palomita underscore Inc. And uh, we will announce uh, our new webinars there as well as other news and nuggets that we find interesting in the open source world. 
uh, from day to day. Okay. Um, any last questions before we drop today? We have one time for one more, if there are. <laughs> 